playing with the pieces. I have so many, literally thousands of pieces, and of course I started this before I had thousands of pieces, but just noticing that some of the things wanted to fit together, because I don't weld or solder. I like things that naturally fit together. Welcome to The Creators, here at Sum City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday, extended conversations that build community making for creators videos, by creators. Art, making what you make. Today on The Creators, sculptor and writer David Random makes rocket ships from reclaimed parts and launches us into other dimensions of our imagination, the deepest of which might just be our own past. So we invite you to subscribe and give us a thumbs up while well, you got to watch the show first. So let's get on with the show. Hi, folks. Welcome back once again to the creators at Sum City, coming to you from beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. With us today, uh, once again, a very special guest and an and artist extraordinaire of uh, really many different types of uh, artistry that we will get to all of them. Uh, but uh, David Rocketman Random is with us here today. <laughs> Welcome to The Creators, David. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. <laughs> well, so you're, you're uh, surrounded by um, rockets, and they're sort rockets that, uh, that you made. <laughs> I did, indeed. <laughs> um, this is a, a wonderful opportunity for, for us on The Creators to, to be showing this kind of creativity that, that makes, I mean, each one of them is this amazing you know, a little visual experience. Um, tell us, how did you first start to get involved in making these wonderful creations? Well, years ago, I was uh, a part-time antique dealer. And I'd go to auctions and come back with boxes of, you know, box lots full of this wonderful old Victorian uh, artifacts and vintage pieces. And at first, I just, you know, hung a few on the wall and you know, admired them for their just their beautiful gracefulness and decorativeness. And then I noticed things kind of started to fit together. And so because of a love of antiques and a childhood fascination with Jules Verne and Flash Gordon, everything seemed to want to be a rocket ship. I have made other things, <laughs> but I'm mo most known for the rocket ships I make. I make quite a few and I have them in um, galleries and museums, uh, as far down as Florida, so they're they've made the rounds. <laughs> and uh, I wondered when. So when you first started doing this, uh, this was pre-internet uh, age. It or? was pre-internet. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Because I've been well, borderline. I've been doing this for maybe fifteen, twenty years. And with the the advent of the internet, uh, and you know, I've, I've seen your website, which is a great visual experience in itself. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm guessing that you've probably spread out in terms of where your work has, uh, has gone, is that right? Um, I think some people may find me on the internet. It's mostly um, word of mouth, I have to say, and also, um, you know, being, having my pieces featured in movies and on TV. Um, people find out that way. So I don't sell anything to speak of through, uh, through my website. People may find me and call me and say, where can I come to see these? Um, right, after, right after I leave here today, I'm meeting a gentleman at my studio who found me on, uh, through my website. But um, it's mostly just informational. If a gallery wants to see more of my pieces, I'll just send them to the, the website because they're so awkward to carry around. I can only fit so many in the car. <laughs> now, you just mentioned uh, movies and television and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, where, where would people be able to, uh, to see your work that has gotten into? Well, there's um, the one that had the most notoriety is a, a short film. It's 15 minutes long. It's called Rocket Ship. And that can be seen online at rocketshipmovie.com. Don't forget the movie, rocketshipmovie.com. It will be running uh, this summer. The uh, Portsmouth Public Library is going to be, their theme for the whole summer is space. So I'm going to have a lot of my rockets there, about 12 or 15. 
They're also running the film rocket ship uh, at least twice during the summer in their big, uh, their big room where they screen things. But uh, rocket ship, the movie rocket ship, is, it's not a documentary. I'm not in it. It's based on my work, however. And I didn't, I didn't make the movie. It's directed by uh, Alfred Thomas Catalfo. And it was uh, featured on Virgin Airways in-flight movies for almost a year. It's played all over the country, um, many, many different film festivals. It won the uh, New Hampshire Film of the Year one year. There are actually when it, one of the times it screened out in San Francisco at a theater, the theater asked the director to come out and the, the film stars a, a boy who was, I think he was 10 years old when he starred in the film. He's a teenager now. But uh, he came out and I came out, the three of us, and uh, we were asked to come up on stage after the screening and they turned on the house lights and people in the audience got to ask us questions. And most of the questions for, were for this little 10-year-old uh, boy who started out so shy he had never done acting. He was not a, a professional actor or anything, never did TV commercials or any of that. But I think this kind of brought him out of his shell because um, we, uh, the director and I went to his elementary school and screened the film there. And what a hero. I, I have the feeling he started out as this quiet, shy kid. And in the film, he gets to... Uh, run from the police, he gets to disobey his parents, he gets to uh, shoplift, <laughs> he gets to set off explosives. So what a hero <laughs> to, the, to this class of uh, elementary school kids. Yeah. So we, we did screen it there and he fielded most of the questions out in San Francisco up on stage and he, without a microphone, he was belting out the answers up to the balcony and you know, he was, wow. I was very impressed with the the change that I saw in him just in, in that short a time. But that was a great experience, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would imagine that, I mean, obviously a lot of adults love these and, and buy them, but I would imagine that kids in general, you know, if they came to, say, your, your studio and, and had a look at some of these, I would imagine they would be uh, in awe of yeah, what Yeah, kids are, um, yes, of course, it's the adult adults that buy them, of course, and I, I'm you know, I, there is, there's never any one particular um, type of person. Men buy them, women buy them, all ages. But you're right, kids, when they come in, in fact, I have um, uh, at Open Studios, which we do twice a year, I usually have about, oh, probably 20 to 25 rocket ships. Of, I try to get my inventory up before Open Studios. And I have uh, a sheet uh, with 20 items on it, and on the top it says, can you find the, and it'll be like binoculars, windshield wipers, ice skate blades, and they're all antique and vintage parts. Mm. So uh, this year, uh, I think I, more adults were doing that than children, <laughs> but it was great. There was, some, there was one woman who wouldn't leave the studio. Her husband, come on, come on, we got to go. She said, no, I got to find the ice skate blades. <laughs> I'm not leaving yet. But uh, it's great for kids, and I had a lot of these at the Children's Museum of New Hampshire, oh. and I did a workshop there for kids, and uh, you know, showing them not only why and how I make these, but explaining what some of the parts were, because I use all antique and vintage parts. I mean, you tell a kid, oh, these are TV antennas, they look at you like you have three heads. Mm. What? What are you talking about? TV antennas? <laughs> so uh, there's, a, there's a learning process that was involved in, in telling kids what some of the parts were, yes. Sure. Uh, and that's the Children's Museum in Dover, New Hampshire. That's right? correct, yeah. yeah. But I've had field trips of kids come to my studio, Cub Scout troops, you know, everything from uh, elementary school on up into high school art classes come, and it's great. I love I just love it when kids come into the studio. It's a very visually stimulating studio, too. Well, this, this is actually kind of a, a good segue, too, in terms of identifying parts. Mm -hmm. if, if you were willing to maybe go through. Sure, um, sure. Uh, when I start, 
When I uh, start making a rocket, and I usually am working on at least two or three at one time because I use all antique and vintage parts, I may be 90% finished with something and I need the final piece because I'm using antique parts. You can't just go down to Walmart or the hardware store and buy something. You've got to wait for the right piece to show up at a flea market or antique shop, which is generally where I get my parts. So that's why I work on several pieces at once. I'll get to a stopping point on one, can't find the final part, so I'll put that aside and move on to the next one. But uh, one of the challenges I have, because um, almost all of my pieces are symmetrical, that means I have to find two identical parts that are vintage parts. Mm. Like these are bullet Rayovac bullet-shaped flashlights. They're called bullet flashlights. And I had to find two. I mean, those weren't so hard. And some things come in pairs. Uh, windshield wipers, salt and pepper shakers obviously come in pairs. So that's not so difficult. But this piece, uh, what I do is I start with the body first. And I'll gather a lot of parts. I have literally thousands of parts in my studio. I'll gather parts that are the same vintage, like this one is being mostly chrome, is more Art Deco style. And I'll gather parts that are that style, like I'm not going to put an old Victorian piece on this. Mm. So the same style and also the same finish, like I'm not going to use something that's brass on this. It's all, it should look like one cohesive part. Right. And I like things that just naturally fit together. This, the body of this, which is what I usually start with, this happens to be a thermos. And it may look fairly new because it's shiny, but on the bottom, which I've covered up, uh, it was patented 1915. So that's an old thermos. Wow. And when you use a thermos, it's interesting because, and I've done this for kids, I make them stand back, but because a thermos is a vacuum bottle, it's lined with glass, and it's actually a vacuum. So in order to drill through that and make these little appendages go into it, I have to get rid of the glass. So what I'll do is I'll set the thermos on the floor, open the top, and I have an, an iron rod, and I wear goggles and a protective gear. I'll hold it maybe a foot above and drop it, and it explodes <laughs> because of the vacuum. So oh this, is, this is actually a, um, a part of the bottom of a salt shaker that's attached to this, and I don't know if you, you probably can't see inside it, but it's a vintage radio vacuum tube. This is a 1959 Cadillac tail light. I These had a feeling. Little thi you knew that. <laughs> These little things are hand pump liquor dispensers on the back of these flashlights, and that's filled with um, cake decorating pellets. This piece here is a vintage hair dryer. On top of the hair dryer is this little thing, which I make people guess what it is. No one knows what it is. It's, uh, it's actually quite rare. I've only found a few of them at antique shops. It holds 20 cigarettes, one pack of cigarettes. <laughs> Back from this from the 30s and 40s when smoking paraphernalia was uh, part of your decor. You'd leave it right. out on your coffee table when guests would come over along with your smoking stand and ashtrays and you know the guests would come over. Yeah. Cigarette. Yeah. Um, that my grandparents had something like, not like this, but they had you know a cigarette holder of some kind. I can remember that. A vintage uh, beehive uh, blender base and various other little things, uh, little reflectors, that type of thing. So uh, that would be one of the, the newer, what I call Art Deco, as opposed to the v more Victorian, which is more Jules Verne. That would be more Flash Gordon, the silvery Art Deco. This is more Jules Verne, which is more known as steampunk. A lot of gears. Uh, a lot of mechanical kind of things. This, the body of this is a newel post from the bottom of a banister. I think when I bought this, uh, you know, it's beautiful shape, beautiful finish. Uh, I talked, I, I bought it at an antique shop. I talked the woman down in price, and as I was leaving, she said, "Oh, that's a beauty. I hope you have the perfect place to put this in your house." <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell her, "No, I'm going to cut it in half." <laughs> but. Uh, this on the top is some kind of valve. I'm not exactly sure, but this turned a valve of some kind. Um, 
This is part of a chandelier. You can see the three arms, but these are vintage brass hose nozzles. Again, I had to find three that match. Yeah. Uh, TV antennas, um, a lot of clock gears. These are uh, just some kind of bra decorative bracket for some kind of Victorian thing. On the front, that part there, the rounded part, is uh, an oil can with another uh, brass hose nozzle on the front. And the base was uh, a smoking stand, had an ash glass ashtray mm. on the top. Do, do you ever get into conversations with you know, the, the antique dealers or, or flea market person uh, with a table? You know, where you actually tell them, well, actually, I'm going to use this for a, a part oh, yeah. in one of the rockets that Absolutely. I make. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And what's their reaction to that? <laughs> well, they want to see, what, what do you mean? Uh -huh. You make rocket ships, what do you mean? So I'll give them a card, and they, hopefully they'll go to my website and see uh, exactly what I do. But, uh, yeah, it's, sometimes I have very interesting conversations with some of these people because a lot of times I'll buy something without knowing what it is. I'll ask them, what is this? And it might be only a part of something and they don't even know what it is and they'll say what you don't know what it is why are you mm -hmm. buying it what are you going to do with mm -hmm. this and then the, I'll tell them but um, like you know there this is uh, another what I would call uh, steampunk uh, piece that all again all brass I'm not going to put a piece of chrome on there or you know something newer but this the base was um, a uh, antique fire extinguisher these are Victorian swing arm drapery hardware that would swing out and the, it would there'd be uh, an extra rod on this that would hold the drapes. This little thing, I'm not sure what that is, but I put a marble in there. Radio vacuum tube, part of a kerosene lamp. This Rex is from an, uh, an antique bicycle, it's a head badge. Again, more clock gears, more, uh, this was from uh, a light fixture. Again, another hose nozzle. I'm not sure what the base was, but uh, it could have been a lamp. I'm not exactly sure. But I scour flea markets. When I'm not in my studio making things, I, uh, I'm at antique shops, flea markets. Used to be yard sales. Yard sales are getting kind of crappy now. It's like, it's like all baby clothes and Tupperware. Once in a while, I'll <laughs> drive by and, and see something that looks interesting. But... They're getting kind of not so good now. Yeah. But I find yeah. enough rocket parts elsewhere. Drive on by. And a lot of times I'll, I'll go to my studio. I'm only, I am only go to my studio maybe three days a week or something like that. But a lot of times I'll go and there'll be old bicycle parts piled outside my door. Mm. <laughs> it's great. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that people are thinking about, you know, I mean, that's great. I love have, getting donations. And... They don't leave notes, I think, because they don't want the stuff back if I can't use it. Right. They, don't, they never want to see it again. But I'm yeah. grateful. And quite frankly, um, some of it I have to throw out because, you know, wow. it's hard to know exactly what I use. But um, I'm going to keep that in mind. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there's something about, I mean, you did mention kind of how you first started to do this type of thing. But that's, that's a little different than, than the question that I'm about to ask. You know, this, this is something that requires a really high level of creativity and imagination, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've never seen anything li exactly like this. Right. So, and, yeah. And, you know, how, where did that come from? Uh, have you ever been able to pinpoint, you know, where, where did this sort of uh, creativity I evolve uh, I think just playing with the pieces. I have so many, literally thousands of pieces. And of course, I started this before I had thousands of pieces. But just noticing that some of the things wanted to fit together. Because I don't weld or solder. I like things that naturally fit together. I mean, these are supposed to look like the different components actually go together. Now, I do use screws and bolts. But even then, I'll use antique screws and bolts. I mean, on these old brass pieces, I'm not about to put, you know, a shiny brass screw there. That would stand out like a sore thumb. So I have, you know, tons of antique hardware in my studio as well. But I think just playing with these pieces, just thinking, oh, that kind of goes on there. And then so many of these pieces just started to look like rocket ships. It's hard to know exactly, um, and I've tried to think about this before, it's hard to know exactly how that 
started specifically, but mm. it really, from playing, that's how a lot of these, and it, when I started, I was making more than just rocket ships. I made uh, some things wanted to be wall cabinets or clocks or things like that, but um, you know, most of them just wanted to gravitate toward rocket ships, and that's now what I'm known for, I guess. <laughs> it, it strikes me as the type of um, artwork that, if, for people who purchase a, a piece from you, do you find that you kind of uh, maintain some sort of ongoing communication at all with some of them in terms of... Rarely, you know, rarely, rarely, because most of my pieces sell out of galleries. So uh, I'll get a check, but I don't, I don't know who buys them, you know, unless sorry. it's someone famous, and that's, I think, only happened once. It was some, um, gosh, I can't even think of his name, the guy who did... Uh, some movie that had to do with a lot of mechanical stuff, but that was the, I think that might be the only time I actually mm. heard what specific person bought it. Because they're, I'm not, you know, other than just sending my pieces out, I, I'm not really in touch with the galleries. I, they're not my galleries, so. Right, right. Uh, just, it, it, they strike me as something, that was, so if, if I was to buy one of these, I'd probably send you, a, whether or not you would actually want to want to receive this, but I'd probably be like, <laughs> hey, so now it's on the mantelpiece at home, I, you know, now it's going to go to my, you know, uh, grandson With some of the like people that. who buy directly from me, like at Open Studios, they're yeah. buying directly from me, I do hear from some of those people, and I've gotten a couple photographs of here, here's how it looks, and you know, so that happens occasionally. So as of, as of this date, as of the, the filming of this episode of The Creators coming to you from some city in beautiful downtown <laughs> Summersworth, New Hampshire, um, Elton John hasn't bought one from you, and neither Not has yet. Kim Young un Not or yet, or no. The other two rocket men <laughs> the other two. that are out there. I was the rocket man first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, as I said in the opening, you know, you're also an artist within other types of art, including uh, writing. And yes, yes. Uh, I would love to hear more about, uh, you brought a couple of your books. I here. did, yeah. Hear more and about I, those. You're right. I mean, I work in a lot of different artistic disciplines my whole life. I mean, I've done painting. I've done um, stained glass. I've, you know, I worked my career uh, starting in the 60s. I was an art director and then creative director at Boston and New York-based advertising agencies, uh, and if you've ever watched Mad Men, that's no exaggeration. That's how it was back in the 60s and the 70s, and mm. so that's where I worked my entire career um, up until my retirement, and that was, I never felt like I went to work. I always felt like I went to play because it was so creative. I did mostly magazine ads and TV commercials. And it was always something different. We had great clients. The agency I worked with the longest was known as a food agency. So we had a lot of, I mean, you walk down any supermarket aisle, and there are all the products we would be advertising, ocean spray and, um, you know, a lot of different things, B&M beans. And to create ads that mostly were in 30-second increments, Back when I started, though, people couldn't just buzz through them like they can now. They had to watch them. There was no way to, to you know, there was no DVR where you could tape something and then fast forward through the commercials. They had to watch if it was interesting enough. And uh, so I've always worked in different, in different disciplines, the advertising being another one. Uh, my books, yes. In fact, my first book was about, um, is a collection of humorous short stories called Defying Gravity, and it's about my years in advertising and all the crazy behind-the-scene stuff that happens, and it does, that people don't ever know about in advertising and how it was way back when, you know, starting in, as I said, in the 60s. So uh, this was my first book. I think there are 20... 20 some odd short stories in that and that's on mm. Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com and all that. 
My next book was also a collection of humorous short stories of my, shall we say, impressionable youth. That's called Gullible's Travels. That, I love the that is my childhood, believe me, <laughs> Gullible. Um, and that's, again, another collection of humorous short stories about, I think they're 23, 24 short stories. And it's great for baby boomers, uh, myself being one, but it's also great for younger people to learn about, whoa, that's how it was way back when. You know, things that, uh, you know, that they scratch their head and say, what? They did that back then? And my latest book, um, I wouldn't want to be doing the same thing all the time. Like you pointed out, I'm doing rocket ships and a, a number of things, and I do writing. But even in my writing, I'm not locked into one genre. Obviously, the first two I showed you were collections of humorous short stories. My latest one is totally opposite that. It's called Connected, and it's a crime novel. It's fiction. It takes place in uh, the Cambridge and Boston area, so there's a lot of local color. And this was, uh, I would say, four and a half to five years of legal and medical research. Wow. And it's a crime novel, but it's not a mystery. And I say that because right in the first chapter, it's a murder. A Harvard professor is stabbed to death in his apartment. And right in the first chapter, an eyewitness comes forward, the murderer's brother, and the killer confesses right in the first chapter. Mm -hmm. So we know who did it. So it's not a whodunit. The whole novel is kind of a legal tug of war because the eyewitness brother and the murderer happen to be conjoined twins. So the police can't even lock up the murderer without locking up his innocent brother. So you can imagine this is a legal dilemma. I'm not giving away the ending. <laughs> <laughs> so that's totally different than a collection of humorous short stories. No humor in this. <laughs> totally different. But it's very suspenseful. <laughs> And totally different in, in the way that you pointed out. You know, it's not like most suspense novels in exactly, the sense that you yeah, know, you're, kind yeah. of, you're kind of kept guessing and wondering until That's the very right. end. That's right. It's not a detective following the yeah. clues and finally finding out who did it, because we know who did it. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, and that's also on Amazon and, and barnesandnoble.com. That had to be, you know, I mean, not that, not that writing the more conventional type of of mystery novel is, is necessarily easy. I wouldn't say that, but at the same time, you certainly took a, a, a route in terms of the style and, and putting you know some of that stuff in the first chapter, as you mentioned. Yeah, and it, there it was had a, to be more challenging. You know? And as I said, there was a lot of research. I yeah. researched. I mean, can, I know more about conjoined twins, <laughs> and I had a legal consultant through the whole process where. I would write a list of a dozen questions for him every few weeks. You know, if this happens in a court in Massachusetts, is it a deposition? Is it a, just a hearing? Who's allowed to ask questions? Is, the, is the, uh, the accused allowed to speak for himself? That type of thing. Because I don't want a lawyer to read this and say, well, that could never happen in a court. You know, I want it to be accurate, and I'm pretty certain it is. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Well, I mean, this seems, uh, the, the answer to this is, is pretty obvious for anybody who's, who's watching, but we do usually ask people who come on the show, uh, even though we know in advance that they are creators, in fact, but when you hear a term like that, you know, a creator, which has become kind of a, kind of a popular term to use for any number of different types of artists or creators of any number sure, of things. Sure, sure. Uh, does that have any particular meaning to you? Do you consider yourself a creator or? Yes. Whenever I hear the term, I go back to one of the freshman classes in college where I went to at Mass College of Art, and I remember one of my professors talking about what creativity is and what art is, and it broadened my scope of what that term creator means. We, or I should say, a lot of people might think it's, it's either photography or painting or illustration or sculpture, you know, kind of basic things. 
but he broadened my outlook on what the definition of creativity is to include not things necessarily where you even end up with something that you can hold or look at. Dancing, choreography, those, that's all creativity. Any process of the human mind that is, that, <clears throat> I don't want to use the word create again, but that makes something that the senses, any sense, can absorb, even taste. A chef mm. is creating. So I, I have a pretty broad definition of creator, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I want to thank you uh, so much for spending some time with us today on The Creators. My pleasure, my pleasure. It's David Rocketman Random, boys and girls, <laughs> and uh, definitely go and check out his website and the, these wonderful works of art and also the books, uh, which, as he mentioned, are available on Amazon. That's it for this episode of The Creators, coming to you from some city in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. Uh, once again, I'm Tom Jackson, and we will see you next time.